Thank you. Right, it's my third party and I'll cry if I want to. And I warn you, I might actually cry because this talk is about the, the dangers, the perils, the absolute minefield that is third party performance. Uh, I'm willing to bet that every site you've ever built has used one, if not several, third parties. And we normally defer to third parties uh, for convenience, right? Normally a third party provides something that we don't want to build ourselves. We may lack the skills or the, the inclination or the funds to build things ourselves. So we kind of defer that to someone else. We get them to do that job for us. But in deferring that, in that convenience, uh, what we end up doing is actually relinquishing a lot of control. And in this talk, I want to look at what we are giving away, what kind of control we are giving to other people, uh, how to measure it, and then how to mitigate it. So we've only got about 45 minutes. There's a lot to cover, so I'm just going to dive straight in. Uh, yeah, I'm Harry. I had a brief intro from Tim there. Uh, the second R isn't silent. I can't even remember how that came up last night. There's a lot of wine involved in that story, but apparently the second R definitely isn't silent. Uh, I'm a performance engineer from the UK, and I work with uh, wonderful clients, lots of very nice clients, uh, helping them make their websites faster. Um, I'm also, as of this month, I guess, a performance ambassador for a startup, a, an e-commerce uh, firm in the UK called Shift. So if anyone's got any performance issues in specifically e-commerce, uh, that's something I'm help, helping tackle kind of from the inside out. So if anyone's dealing with e-commerce problems, uh, some really exciting stuff coming with, uh, with Shift Commerce. Um, when I was preparing a talk about third parties, uh, which is kind of depressing, right? Last year, I seemed to talk about refactoring, which is a miserable subject. This year, it seems to be third parties. I always get the worst topics. Um, but what happened is I kind of was reminded immediately of this news story. It's quite an old news story from 2008. But as soon as I thought about uh, third parties, I was reminded of this, because this news story involves uninvited guests uh, and financial repercussions. Well, it's the real-life risky business. A teenager holds an alcohol fueled party for hundreds of kids while his unsuspecting parents are on holiday. 16-year-old Corey Worthington is now facing not only the wrath of mum and dad, but a $20,000 fine from police. I spoke to him a short time ago. Corey, thanks for joining us. The only question that I can think to ask is, what were you thinking? Um, I wasn't really. Did your parents say you could have a party? Um, no. So, they didn't. why did you? Um, I don't know, it was just a get together with a couple of mates at first and then we thought we might as well just have a bit of a party and then it sort of just got out of hand and, yeah. <laughs> I fucking hate that guy. I hate that guy so much. Um, what a dick. But that last sentence as well struck me, it reminded me of something else. It, you know, understatement of the century, it got out of hand. But most third-party performance issues are unintentional, right? It's just things got out of hand. We didn't keep an eye on things. We let things slip, right? Things just got out of hand. That reminded me of a client that got in touch with me uh, earlier this year. They said, Harry, we think we've got a problem with third parties. And I said, look, I've seen it all before. Nothing scares me. Send it over. Let's take a look. This one did scare me. This one scared me quite a lot. This is the web page test that I ran. And this is what the developer believed they had built. And indeed, this is actually what the developer had built. What we've got on screen right now is first-party content. This is the web page. This is what the development team had produced. And what they do is they kind of go home thinking, yeah, did a good job today, built a fast website. But when a customer hits the site, it's a very different story. Because what a developer sees on, in a dev environment is a very different beast to what actually goes live and goes to a customer. So it's kind of a disconnect. I realize that a lot of the problem with third parties is a complete disconnect where what the engineering team see and what the customer receive are often very different things because at some point, somebody added a tag manager to this page and the tag manager kicks in in production and what actually goes to the customer looks a little more like this. Get comfortable. Now, this wasn't done on purpose. Nobody set out to build a slow website here. It's this disconnect. It's this lack of sort of context and awareness. Uh, your engineering environment, your dev environment is fast machines. You probably don't have all your retargeting, your tracking, your analytics working on your dev site. As soon as this stuff kicks in, this is what goes to customers. This is disrespectful, right, if nothing else. This is sleazy stuff that's tracking people around the web. Uh, interesting statistic, 20% of British people in 2015, that's when the uh, data was sort of uh, uncovered, 20% uh, of British people still use a pay-as-you-go phone contract, right? They pay-as-you-go. This literally is costing people money. 
So this is the kind of problem we're dealing with, and it's all down to this disconnect, and that's what I want to try and cover in this talk. Uh, I've broken the talk into four key sections. One is understand. Understand what the risks are to us when we employ third parties. Two, audit them. How do we actually measure the impact and effect of those third parties? Three, by far the hardest bit is discussing them. How do we raise issues with third-party providers? How do we discuss it internally? How do we tell our marketing team that what they're doing might be slowing the website down? And finally, uh, mitigation. How do we start to defensively design around these things? So, yeah, understand. Understanding the problem. How can third parties affect us? Um, the worrying answer is in, it's in many different ways, lots of different ways they can affect us. I'm going to start with the one I know least about, which is security. Um, you're inviting people into your website, right? And you've got to trust that they know what they're doing. But each of those third parties can have their own third parties, and it's really easy to lose track of what's, running, uh, what's going on on your web pages. The simplest thing is maybe the third party is running over an insecure connection. And if you get uh, an insecure sort of asset coming over the wire, you can potentially get mixed content warnings. So at its most basic, you could begin to erode customer trust, right? They're getting mixed content warnings. Uh, your site appears to be insecure. But if those responses are insecure, they could be man in the middle. Someone could tamper with these third parties and compromise them. Or there's also the scenario that maybe the third party is just a bad actor. Maybe it's just a sleazy, kind of scumbaggy third party. I was on a flight to Iceland uh, last year, and this was during a period when my site uh, could be accessed over a secure or an insecure connection. Now, what you can see here is uh, Iceland Air were man in the middle me, right? Uh, what I've actually done is, I shouldn't have done this, but to make the screenshot a little clearer, I deleted a bunch of stuff from the DOM. They were advertising to me on my own website. They were man in the middle me. Now, that's kind of sleazy, but the performance implications were they're downgrading me to an H1.0 connection. This is slowing my site down because I was getting a man in the middle by running an insecure connection. This is the kind of thing you would leave yourself prone to uh, if you're doing the same. Uh, interestingly, if I just visited HTTPS, it would immediately sling me onto an H2 connection. Everything was much faster. And like I said, there's the rare scenario that maybe the third party is just a bad actor. Uh, YouTube were busted running uh, crypto mining ads from a third party of theirs uh, on YouTube.com. YouTube has recently caught displaying ads that covertly leech off visitors' CPU and electricity in order to generate digital currency on behalf of anonymous attackers. Right? If you were watching a YouTube video during this period, there's every chance you were mining crypto for someone. So at a minimum, pull everything from secure origins. Don't use a third party that doesn't provide secure responses. Uh, further to that, though, if we have TLS everywhere, we get actual platform-level features that we can utilize that are all performance-oriented. We can start using H2, Service Worker, Brotly. Uh, features like that are only available over a secure connection, so there are direct performance benefits there as well. So security is the one that I know least about, uh, but delays is something that we probably all know something about. It doesn't take me to tell a room of performance engineers that you know, time is money, and delays in third parties are a bad idea. Uh, the delay could be on the network. It could be download delays. It could be high sort of latency. It could be low bandwidth. So there could be uh, direct sort of network issues between first and third parties. Third-party infrastructure could be um, sort of a compromise. They could be having an outage. They could be getting DDoSed. Um, don't want to seed kind of like nasty ideas in people's minds, but I was discussing with a client recently. They were using code.jQuery.com to load their j uh, jQuery. It struck me that if you wanted to wreak havoc on a lot of the web, if you were like a little script kiddie, DDoSing someone like code.jQuery would have huge net, like a huge network effect. Uh, so we immediately just pulled that onto a first party, didn't um, use uh, a third party to host that kind of stuff. But this is what you leave yourself susceptible to. And also, third party runtime. Looked at this a lot in the previous talk. Uh, getting the JavaScript is only part of the problem, right? When it starts running on the device, uh, has it been optimized to run quickly? A uh, client and friend who's actually sat in the audience right now, a guy called Ryan, uh, he's the CTO of Shift Commerce. And I really like this little tale of his. Um, this is Ryan discussing with a third party provider uh, the idea that, you know, I think your third party script is slowing us down. So Ryan got on a call with this, uh, this third party provider. And their response to Ryan's concerns were, ah, there's zero performance overhead to using our synchronous script. Our typical response time is around 200 milliseconds. Well, pick one. Is it zero or is it 200 milliseconds? <laughs> Right? It can't, can't be both. Uh, and this is very naive, and it's a synchronous script. So even if there are zero delays, if anything's running smoothly, um, what if they're just actually having an outage, right? You know, it's a synchronous script. So what if the network is generally fine, but the third party is down? Um, 200 milliseconds is big, big, big numbers when we're talking about web performance. And to a lot of companies, this could be measured financially. 
Trainline, a client of mine, uh, published a really, really fascinating case study. If they could reduce uh, latency by 0.3 seconds, uh, customers would spend an extra 8.1 million pounds every year. So accordingly, 200 milliseconds is worth 5.4 mil to someone like Trainline. Uh, Mobify, um, for them, 200 milliseconds would be three quarters of a million dollars a year. So again, that 200 milliseconds doesn't seem so innocent anymore. Uh, but my favorite case study is, uh, is Walmart, right? So Walmart found that for every 100 millisecond improvement, that resulted in up to a 1% increase in revenue. So I did some quick back of a napkin math. I dug up their financials. Uh, Walmart are rich, right? They make money. Um, so for 200 milliseconds, that'd be a 2% increase in revenue. Based on their 2017 revenues, e-commerce only, two, uh, 200 milliseconds could be a potential loss of $230 million a year. Extrapolating this case study to 200 milliseconds uh, and their last year financials, 2% increase in revenue would be a $230 million increase in revenue in a year. Now it goes one worse. These are delays. What happens if the site is down completely? What if we've got a single point of failure? You know, let's imagine that you know, everything else is running fine, but the third party has just gone offline. What if they're suffering an outage? This is your absolute worst case scenario. And, uh, and it does happen. In fact, I was working with a client earlier this year, and we, were, we already had our suspicions about a specific third party. I'd audited it previously, and I was like, I think you know, this is a bit of a vulnerability. Completely by chance, when I was out on site with the client, this third party we were already having our doubts about had a full-on outage. And it's pushing load times globally up to around 90 seconds. And I'll explain why that is with that. Uh, this isn't the client in question. This is another client of mine. Uh, this video shows me loading sky.com. Now, sky.com, uh, what we'll see is we've made a connection to the server. We can see we've got a secure connection. But there's a file here, this a tag manager, that's pending. Adobe Tag Manager is having an outage right now. And look at the tab bar. The tab has zero readable text. We're just showing the, the URL. Now, I'm a sort of reasonably technical fa uh, chap. I can tell that you know, something weird's going on. But to a civilian, right, to a normal internet user, this site just looks broken. There's nothing at all in the title. Uh, we're getting a blank screen. And it's because we've got a synchronous script that's currently suffering an outage directly in front of the title tag. So the parser cannot proceed past line 9, can't even find line 11 yet. So we're still not able to show any usable content to the user. So my quickest, tiniest bit of advice here is put your title tags before any other, like any external asset in your head tags, just to mitigate this problem. The fix is obviously more like complete. We should asynchronously load this script, but we've managed to show the user absolutely zero. And what's going to happen? Uh, I actually made the uh, my client watch this video, and they were horrified. Uh, this is what we leave ourselves vulnerable to. Um, if a third party has an outage. We've got to wait until Chrome times out. And that timeout should be happening soon. I should have kept an eye on my timer. But Chrome's timeout is around uh, 80 seconds. So it's about 1.2 minutes. Um, finally, we get something, 1.3 minutes. No one's going to wait for 1.3 minutes. People are going to assume this site is down. They're going to go to a competitor, right? They could have lost a, a, a customer for life there. This is really serious stuff. That's all because of one analytics package, one third party tag manager, sorry, uh, suffering an outage. Now, the problem here isn't Adobe Tag Manager, and it's not JavaScript. I don't want to point fingers at specific people. Um, if you're loading, uh, naively loading fonts.googleapis.com, you will absolutely leave yourself prone to the exact same problems. Any synchronous or blocking asset on a third party, if that third party has an outage, this will happen to you. So it's not JavaScript. It's not unique to JavaScript. Uh, this will block rendering for 1.3 minutes. This is serious stuff, and it's what we leave ourselves vulnerable to when we defer to third parties. So how do we measure this? Um, this is a really important part of my job, is actually measuring this stuff for clients. I, I find that because there is a bit of a disconnect, a lot of engineers don't know where to start looking with this stuff. Uh, they didn't imp implement the third party script, right? Somebody with a tag manager did that. So what I'm going to go through is uh, how I audit the impact and the cost and the, uh, the, sort of the, the risks associated with third parties. The first thing I do is have a really high level initial sweep. Very sort of non-scientific, but just to give myself an idea of how severe the problem might be, I do an initial sweep of uh, third-party performance. And to do that, get your phones ready, take a picture of this slide. I use requestmap.webperf.tools. This is a really, really fantastic utility. Um, I'll, I'll, lump, I'll loop back to this slide in a second. Uh, but request map allows you to plot the sort of different origins that a given page visits. So it basically gives you a network graph of all the third parties a page might utilize. 
Now, the way I do this specifically is I will first run a web page test. I, I like using web page tests for pretty much anything performance related. Uh, run a web page test as your starting point, as your kind of ba uh, your baseline, and grab its ID and just plug it into requestmap.webperf.tools. This is kind of a long-winded way of doing things, but this is how I like to do it because then I've got the web page test data separately. And what that's going to give you is a network graph like this. My clients and I have lovingly dubbed this the jellyfish. Um, and what this does is it tells you roughly how severe or what the kind of impact of third parties might be on a given page. The size of each blob represents the number of bytes from that domain. The distance between each blob represents the mean time to first byte between those two domains. Uh, and the thickness of each line represents the number of requests between those domains. So this is CNN. CNN should have the fastest website, given that it's always used in every performance example ever, but they still don't. This is the CNN website. Uh, it's actually the lightweight version as well, uh, the international version. Um, but yeah, what we can see here is um, a nice data viz, and this is quite good to put in front of marketing teams because uh, it's not dry, kind of boring data at this point. It does give a good idea of how severe the problem might be. But to me, a performance engineer, I do want to get a little more analytical. So what I do is I grab the CSV that, um, that this, uh, this tool gives us, and uh, it gives us a nice dump of basically all of the information that that graph was plotting. What type of third party was it? What was its domain? Uh, how many bytes did we download from that origin? Uh, all the data that was behind that data viz, we can grab the raw numbers. Uh, don't laugh, I don't really write much um, or at all, but uh, when you get hold of these slides, after you've got your CSV, what this little one-liner will do is it will extract all of the third-party data from this file. Uh, so you've basically removed all the first-party information, and it will just give you the text, right? the resulting text that you can then copy and paste. And the reason why I uh, mentioned web page test is because when you've got all that third-party raw data, the list of domains, sorry, you can drop it into web page test. There's this really great block feature where you can just paste every third party origin into web page test, rerun the test with all the third parties missing. So like I said, this is very broad strokes, very high level, but this gives me a good idea of what does the site look like with all your third parties and then with none of your third parties. Um, this for the CNN website was an interesting one then. So um, the load time was getting pushed back quite severely by third parties, but load isn't important. We don't care, right? That's not a useful metric anymore. Luckily, start render and speed index weren't severely different. So what we can see here is that generally third parties are employed fairly sensibly on this site. Um, it's not severe, right? We're not pushing start render back by a massive, massive amount. However, if we look at things like the number of requests, uh, requests were reduced by over four times when I removed third parties. So we're giving way more network kind of uh, sort of time to third parties here, four times more than first parties. Um, page weight was drastically reduced, so by a factor of three, we reduced page weight. That means that if any of your users are paying for data as they go, uh, that page, the useful content, cost them N. The third parties cost them three times more than that. The stuff they didn't want cost them three times more. But yeah, this is very extreme, very non-scientific. Uh, but I do this as a first kind of step in any third party auditing uh, process, just to give me an idea of how severe the problem might be. Next, we might to look at specific domains, right? So the previous example, the example we just looked at was getting rid of all third parties. But I want to drill down into what happens if one particular origin is running slowly. This is a really important question to ask. What happens to us if Typekit runs slowly? What happens to us if uh, Adobe Tag Manager runs slowly? Very important question to ask. And thankfully, it's a very, very easy question to answer. Uh, grab a copy of Charles, if you haven't already. Uh, Charles is free in the same way that Sublime Text is free. Um, yeah, I'll pay for that tomorrow, sure. Grab a copy of Charles. Uh, it's a really, really useful tool. Um, it's a, basically it's a network proxy, but what I use it for is this specific throttling feature. There's a part of Charles. So you've got like your Chrome DevTools throttling, which is OK. Uh, Charles does throttling at the network level. And it goes one further. Uh, you can actually just throttle specific domains. So here I can answer the question, what happens if fonts.googleapis is running slowly? Or in this particular screenshot, we had a client who was uh, putting all their assets on a CDN. It was important for us to know what is the risk to the page if the CDN is running slowly. So we can start to pinpoint individual uh, uh, providers here. The next thing, uh, when it starts to get really severe, is when we look at outages, right? We need to ask the question, what happens if X goes down? What happens if uh, Adobe Tag Manager goes offline? What happens if our third-party authentication provider goes offline? What happens if Google Fonts goes offline? Uh, really important question to ask. Again, a very simple question to answer. Web page tests make available a black hole server. 
It's available at blackhole.webpagetest.org, but don't visit that in a browser. Uh, what it does is it just, any network traffic that passes through that domain just goes missing. It simulates a full-on outage. Now, you can grab the IP address of that or, uh, domain, stick it in your host file, and begin to map specific third-party domains against this IP address. What this will do is it will locally simulate an outage. So you can see the actual effects of a third-party outage without having to just wait for that third party to eventually go down. This is exactly how I made this screenshot. So uh, this, is, this will be of interest to you. Um, I've got clients who make heavy use of Google Fonts um, for commercial application, right? So there isn't really a license that says you can't do that. But also, interestingly, Google Fonts doesn't have a service level agreement. If they go down, they make no promise to you. They make no, they make no, excuse me, they make no guarantee. They don't need to apologize if they go down, and that's a concern, right? Many businesses use Google Fonts, and Google Fonts make no promises. However, the interesting bit is I got in touch with Google Fonts about this. They've never had an outage. In the entire time Google Fonts has been up, they've never once had any outage whatsoever. So it's statistically very, very safe, but it's still worth auditing, right? It's worth being aware if your site hinges on Google Fonts or any third-party provider, you need to be aware of the risk of using them. Um, yeah, next thing is missing files. This is an interesting one. Um, in fact, I had a client literally last week suffered this problem. What if files don't make it? What if for some reason a file is blocked by an ad blocker, right? A critical file may be inadvertently blocked by something, or the file may have an unrecoverable JavaScript error that only happens in certain browsers. What happens if a file goes missing? Jake said this a few years ago now, but uh, all of your users are non-JS whilst they're downloading your JavaScript. There is a period at which every single one of your visitors is a non-JavaScript user. It's a semi-controversial opinion of mine, but I don't think we should ever optimize for the non-JavaScript use case. Right? If a user has turned JavaScript off, they knew what they were doing. So I don't believe we should optimize for people who've turned JavaScript off. But instead, what we should consider is what happens if some of that JavaScript goes missing? How well does our JavaScript fail? We had a problem at a client of mine last week where we um, rolled a release, and it, we just happened to version bump a JavaScript library. Uh, it wasn't anything to do with what we'd done, but NPM grabbed the new version, and it hadn't been thoroughly tested in a specific version of iOS. In iOS, uh, the date object was actually returning as a string, which meant the entire application, it's a fully client-rendered application, just fatally errored. We didn't recover from this at all. We showed an infinite loading spinner. We could have defensively programmed around this. What happens if something goes missing? There's a really interesting story of this happening on like a massive scale. A few years ago, um, T-Mobile, and most network providers do this, most cell providers, if you're running an insecure connection, what they will do is they'll proxy what you're visiting through their own servers, and they'll look at an image, and they'll be like, oh, this image hasn't been optimized. We'll optimize that for them and pass it down to the mobile device. Oh, this file hasn't been gzipped. We'll gzip this file and pass it on to the user. Now, a few years ago, what T-Mobile were doing is popping open JavaScript files, uh, and they opened jQuery to find that there was a starting comment, like a slash star. And they thought, oh, you know, someone hasn't minified this. There's a huge comment in this file. And they just started deleting. Now, it wasn't a comment. It was a reg regular expression, right? It was a string. It was a slash star. And they just kept deleting until the closing comment was found. But there was no closing comment, because it was a regular expression. And they just trimmed off like two-thirds of jQuery, patted themselves on the back for a job well done, and sent down broken jQuery to hundreds of thousands of users. This problem persisted for several days. The solution here is, you know, use TLS everywhere, have a secure connection, you can't be proxied like this. But this is a real thing that affected hundreds of thousands of users. Just last week, I had a client have the exact same problem. We need to test for the use case of something going missing. Um, to do that is made trivial, again, uh, with modern tooling. Locate the asset in your network chart in Chrome, right-click it, and block request URL. Every subsequent refresh of this page will load the page with that asset missing. With this particular client, this is a client I worked with at the beginning of the year, uh, we found that, yeah, if our main app.js has any error or goes missing, we just showed an infinite loading spinner. We could defensively program around this. We could do something to recover this. Hey, please try refreshing the browser. Hey, something's gone wrong. But we didn't. We just gave the user a complete blank screen. Well, not blank, but useless screen. The next thing we need to audit is runtime cost. What happens if everything's running smoothly? We got the files we expected. We got them in a timely manner. There was no outage. But what happens if the third-party script is just badly built? What if it's running very expensive code once it arrives? It's always nice as a performance engineer to blame someone else. So I'll show you exactly how to do that. It's really nice. OK, not my fault, not my problem. Um, it's kind of nice because it means I don't have to fix it. But it's kind of bad because I can't fix it if it's someone else's fault, right? So it's kind of a good news, bad news. But um, in DevTools, pop open your performance panel and run a profile. 
Uh, jump into the summary tab, then move across to bottom up. And there's a really nice uh, ability to group by different categories. We want to group by domain. What group by domain will show you is which domain is causing the most runtime overhead. This is a fully client rendered React application, so I fully expect and understand that the first party domain would be the most expensive. There's nothing that alarms me here. But what I can also do is group by specific URL, group by file. This is worrying. It turns out that um, Google Tag Manager is more expensive than React on this page. Right? Our third party script, our third party Tag Manager, is more expensive than a 1.2 meg React bundle. This is a cause for concern. My immediate thing here is go and have a meeting with the marketing team, see what kind of A-B test they're running, see what kind of things are on the site, and start to solve these problems there. What's also really nice is that um, these, will, uh, these values update in real time as you kind of scrub across the performance panel. So we can see that um, at certain points in the page, what is running at which point. Uh, here we're prioritizing third party scripts ahead of first party. Simply deferring these third party scripts mean that we don't give too much um, preferential treatment, if you will, uh, to third parties. It'd be much nicer to deal with our stuff first. Next part of the talk is, I'm afraid, Oh, spoilers. Um, is the hardest bit, right? The hardest bit is discussing. Uh, most of these problems have got technical solutions, and the technical bit is usually the easiest bit. We can solve most of that. The hardest bit is bringing this up with clients or with third-party providers, because uh, people are difficult, right? People, there are egos involved. Um, you don't want to rock up to a marketing team and say, hey, everything you do day in, day out makes this site worse. No one's going to take well to that. It's my job as a consultant to have these awkward discussions, though, so I'm kind of used to this. What I want to do is share some of the sort of tactics uh, that I use to kind of start broaching this subject in the most productive way I can, I can. One of the worst things I hear from clients is like, yeah, we know we've got loads of third parties, but it's a necessary evil. We have to. Right? We don't want to, but we have to. And I think this is the laziest answer they could possibly give. Because we really need to dissect what each of these words means. It's not that black and white. Right? Is it really necessary? Do you need to be tracking your users around the internet? Do you need that? Uh, is typekit evil? I wouldn't have said so. So why would you say it's a necessary evil? Loads of different questions need kind of picking out of this um, because I think it's a really common answer. We don't want to, but we have to. It's like, no, you don't have to. Or maybe you do, but we really need to assess why. And is it the right thing to do? A third party crypto mining thing is definitely in the evil camp, right? So bringing these uh, topics up with vendors is quite an interesting one. So the actual third party providers, as we saw earlier, uh, Ryan, CTO of a kind of performance oriented company, knows to pick up the phone, right? If you've got a third party provider that you're spending money with, uh, they owe it to you to explain any degradation in performance, right? So you could pick up the phone. Sometimes you don't have uh, such nice access to those third parties though. So um, what I'd recommend you do uh, in, in this order is one form a hypothesis. If you think a third party is running slowly, you're probably correct. Form your hypothesis. Uh, find the culprit. Second bit is the most important. Gather data. Gather more data than you think you need, because there's nothing more embarrassing than ringing a third party, telling them they're slow, and they tell you that you've just implemented it wrong. And you're like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Gather data. Make sure you are 100% correct about what you're measuring, because there's, trust me on this, there's nothing more embarrassing than going to a third party, telling them they're, telling them they're at fault, only to find it was you all along. Uh, and three, let them know. And letting them know can be quite difficult. It depends how your relationship is with that third party. If it's a third party that you do spend a lot of money with, you've got like an account with them, uh, you may have a direct, uh, uh, a direct account manager. You can raise support tickets. If you're spending tens of thousands of euro a year with a third party provider, there's going to be someone there that you can raise issues with. Uh, that's if you're spending a lot of money. However, most third parties are a bit of a black box. It might just be someone that you're using a, a free tool, right? Analytics, Google Analytics, you can't really just ring someone at Google up for that, right? So there may be community forums, um, you, know, you can open pull requests if it's on GitHub. The point I'm making here is all of this is better than doing nothing, right? Just sitting back, oh, it runs slowly, but it's not our, it's not our script, we can't do anything about it. There's always something you can do. Um, a lot of the time, third parties are a complete black box. You don't even know what, they, you might not even know um, where they're coming from, right? It could be a third party's third party. You've got no way of getting in touch with this company. So defer to point four, tweet at them. This one works really well because it's public, right? And you're saying, oh, I think your site's slow. Someone's going to respond. My uh, ad provider were running, uh, they've they, you know, got a little ad in my sidebar of my website. Uh, they're using Target Blank, and Target Blank has performance and security concerns. So I tweeted at them, hey, can you get your devs to implement this, please? And 
about six weeks later, it was live and they did it, right? Just ask. If you don't ask, they're definitely not going to do it. Um, DHL were running uh, an application uh, insecurely, or rather, you could access the app securely or insecurely. The application was asking for personal data, uh, addresses, billing details, and stuff. I just tweeted at DHL, hey, can you get your engineers to force this onto a secure connection? Simple redirect, right? They just needed to force you onto the, uh, the secure connection. Uh, they did. Uh, this one, I'm not even sure who this company is. Lotame, I've never heard of them. They're a third party of mine's third party, right? Um, so I just looked up Lotame on Twitter. I said, hey, look, you've got a problem with this. Uh, can you please you know, look into it? Their CTO got back to me directly. This was their CTO. What the point I'm trying to make here is that doing something as trivial as this is better than doing nothing at all, and it can have surprisingly good effect. So that's dealing with third parties themselves. How do we deal with the teams that implement these third parties? This is always the hardest bit, because like I say, you can't just rock up to a marketing team and tell them they're ruining the site, right? Because there are egos at play. Well, it's just not a nice thing to do, right? You know, everyone's got a job to do, and we can't really sort of make people feel bad about that. So what I try and do is go with data, and I go with stuff to ask decent questions. So remember the CSV file from before, from the little jellyfish? We're going to use that CSV file again. Um, I've got a Google Sheet that I'm going to share with you. It's like a template for uh, having these discussions. I find people in businesses love spreadsheets. They will trust anything in a spreadsheet. Um, get ready, there's another URL coming up, so if you want to take a picture of it, you can do. The slides are already online, so don't panic. But um, I'm going to give you something like this. This little, um, this little spreadsheet here is just for my website. I use very few third parties, but using the data from the little CSV file, what I've done is I've categorized um, the provider and, uh, sorry, I've, I've listed the provider and category. And if there are duplicates, we color them in yellow. This allows you to roughly proxy that, oh, we're using more than one analytics provider. We're using more than one font provider. So you can easily spot duplicates. Why are we using more than one uh, web font provider, right? Can we trim the fat? Can we get rid of anything there? Uh, the red stuff shows the severity of that third party. And the red is gradiated from the 0th percentile to the 90th percentile. That's a smooth gradient. And that shows you the severity kind of ascendingly. Anything that's solid red is anything from the 90th to 100th, 100th percentile. Anything that's solid, darkest red, these are the things to focus on immediately. So this roughly tells me that um, uh, buy sell ads is uh, sending quite a lot of data over the wire, as is Twitter. If I want to trim uh, weight from my page, these are the third parties I need to start focusing on. So. I'm going to make this um, spreadsheet available to you. It's already available to you. Um, run a web page test, uh, run a web perf tools, the request mapper thing, grab that CSS view file, and all we need to do is just import it over the top of this template. Um, the reason I'm showing you this in detail is there's a subtle thing we need to be aware of. In order for the conditional formatting to keep working, you can't just import the data into a new sheet. You have to paste it over the top of the other stuff. So yeah, import, grab something from file, uh, from your sorry, file system, the important bit here is replace data at selected cell, right? This won't work if you don't follow this one specific bit. So replace data at selected cell, and it will just drop it on top of this conditional formatting. And we can see that CNN looks a bit more like this. You got that, Steve? Good. So um, now we've got this information, we can begin to have these meetings. Uh, we can go to the marketing department and say, hey, just so you know, I've done an audit of your third parties. Can we talk about them? This is the important bit. At this stage, we need to ask, not tell. Don't rock up saying, we've decided to get rid of your analytics package because it's slowing the site down. That's the wrong way to go about this. The important thing here is that we ask, don't tell. So arrange a meeting, right? Gather the data, stick it in that spreadsheet, uh, organize a meeting with whoever you need to. It could be the head of marketing, it could be the entire marketing department, uh, but ask questions. It's imperative at this point that we listen and we don't demand or, or kind of command that they do things. Uh, and just learn. The first meeting we have should be a simple learning exercise. You might want to ask them, hey, can you just talk me through Google Tag Manager? I've never used it before. Can you give me a 30-minute workshop? Because that will allow you as an engineer to know about the use cases. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these, because you can read, presumably. Um, are there any services in here we don't recognize is the most important one? This is the most important one, because you'll find things like, oh, we were meant to delete that. I didn't know we hadn't. I was working with a client recently. Uh, they've got Optimizely running on their site. Uh, the Optimizely JavaScript bundle is half a meg after being decompressed. It takes a lot of time on the CPU. It's a synchronous third-party script, so it's slowing the page down. If Optimizely has an outage, it's going to be bad news. Uh, they haven't had an account with Optimizely for nine months. <laughs> the, the account, like, we don't use it anymore. We'll get rid of the account. They're still linking to this file. They have been for nine months. They weren't aware of this. So asking these questions allows marketing teams to kind of come up with their own answers. 
Um, this is the URL for that um, third party sort of uh, spreadsheet. So if you want to go and grab that template, it's already there, you can grab that. But I cannot stress this enough. When we're discussing third parties, it's critical that we ask more questions uh, in, the, in the first instance. Just understand the use cases. Building that empathy allows us to say, oh, right, that's a really good use case for that. But did you know we've got an internal tool that does that already? Ask questions, learn why we lean on these things, and then you're more equipped to solve them. Finally, the last part of the talk is mitigation. How do we start to design around these? Right? How do we actually begin to take the edge off of these problems? First thing I would recommend is wherever possible, self-host. Right? If you can, self-host any third party. Even if it's a third party file that you can host on a first party domain, that's better than having it on an external origin. Example from uh, earlier this week, I was with a client, uh, they were linking to CDN, uh, is it code.jquery.com. Just grab that file and host it locally. Right? You then mitigate uh, the outage problem, the slow origins problem, the DDoS problem. Self-host whatever you can. You can control your own infrastructure. There's nothing more frustrating than your site running smoothly, but a third party outage has taken you offline. If a first party outage has taken you offline, you've got bigger things to worry about than jQuery, right? So host as much of your own content as you can. Uh, and we get direct performance benefits, you know, reduced network negotiation, DNS, TCP, TLS. Uh, we can dictate our own caching strategy. You could put things in a service worker cache if it's from your own origin. Uh, and preload, right? Steve talked about preload earlier. Uh, if we're hosting our own fonts, we can use our own font display directives. We can um, give more aggressive caching. We can start to preload them. So where possible, self-host any critical assets. In any event that we can't self-host something, make sure we can load that asset asynchronously. Uh, synchronous blocking scripts create a, uh, uh, a single point of failure. Not just scripts as well, so blocking style sheets. Uh, so use any provided asynchronous method. If a third party gives you an asynchronous method of loading something, utilize it. If a third party doesn't provide an asynchronous method of loading their assets, maybe avoid them, because they haven't properly thought out the scenario of what happens if we go offline. It should be a real red flag if any third party provider does not give you an asynchronous method of including their content. Um, the sky.com issue I showed you earlier, um, the very, very short term fix for like, the perceived kind of user uh, sort of facing benefit would be just swap the title and the script around so at least we can give something in the browser's title tab. But the simple fix for this was just stick an async on there, right? We talked about this loads in the first talk. Remove anything from the critical path that isn't, doesn't need to be there. The irony of a tag manager that's meant to like, optimize you know, conversions and track people actually taking a site offline, the irony is not lost on me, right? You can't measure anyone if you're slamming the door in their face. Don't prioritize your third party metrics above the user experience because there's no point in measuring something that no one can access. Next thing, this is a very specific tip, but yeah, resource hints. So we talked about preload in the previous talk. Um, if we do have to go to third party origins, we can begin to take the edge off that by pre connecting those origins. Every trip to a new domain carries network negotiation, DNS, TLS, uh, TCP. Uh, we might as well deal with that ahead of time. Traditionally, a browser will deal with this stuff at the last possible moment, at the most inopportune moment. Uh, we can take the edge off that by using pre-connect. So what I would recommend is doing a quick sweep of your site, look at what third-party providers you frequently hit. Uh, we've got font providers, social media stuff, we've got ad networks, there'll be some analytics in there. Identify these domains and simply preload them, uh, sorry, pre-connect them. Uh, this is an actual snippet from my site, so uh, what I've done is to not just indiscriminately preload the whole site's worth of uh, third-party origins, I've actually written a little tiny, tiny bit of templating logic that says, on these pages, I will need these third parties, so pre-connect them then. The bottom line, uh, every single page on my site uses Google Analytics, so I don't do that conditionally. Um, but what you want to do is avoid wasteful pre-connect, right? Don't make the browser do things it doesn't need to do. Uh, and what we can do now is we can begin to move this network um, uh, negotiation away from the file download. We can divorce these couple of things. Now, train line, 0.3 second improvement in performance, 8.1 million pounds more a year. Imagine typing a few pre-connects and getting 8 million pounds more a year, right? It's really that easy, so make use of this. My only advice here with any resource hints, uh, but specifically pre-connect that we're looking at, only warm up frequent, significant, and known origins. Um, one thing I see a lot of people doing uh, mistakenly is pre-connecting third parties, third parties. They might look at a waterfall chart and say, oh, this went and got the Facebook SDK, so I'll pre-connect Facebook. 
If the third party you're using stops linking to Facebook, you're going to be doing wasteful pre-connects. So be conservative, right? Look at critical and frequent third parties and warm those domains up. The very, very last part of this talk then, uh, sorry, the very last tip I've got with, uh, with regards to mitigation, uh, I feel really bad because it's by far the laziest. But one of the biggest tools we've got to protect against third party vulnerabilities is just exercising some restraint, right? No one wants to hear this because it's by far the hardest to implement. It's the hardest to quantify. But the biggest tool we've got is restraint. Try and use as little as possible for as long as possible. Be very suspicious of third parties. Be reluctant to use them. Only defer to third parties when you can't see a more uh, appropriate solution. This is by far the hardest one to solve, but if you can get by with as little as possible for as long as possible, you're automatically going to, safe, going to safeguard yourself against these third party issues. Whew, that was a lot. That's me saying thank you very much for listening. It was good. Let's do it. Nicely done, sir. Cheers, dude. Um, so just to sort of level set, one of the questions that kind of came up was um, when you're talking about third party versus you know, your own thing, uh, does your own CDN provider, are you lumping that in with third party in this conversation, or is it, is it strictly a single origin? Um, when you say strictly a single origin, do you mean? Uh, so like, if, like you're, if you're, yeah, if you're hosting on your own CDN, would mm -hmm. you count that as a third party? In Technically, yeah, a, a third party origin. So if you're using cdn.website.com, uh, you need to be aware of, you know, that is extra network negotiation. Uh, you've probably got more control over that CDN than you would have, you know, Google Fonts, for example. But um, from a technical perspective, I would class that as a third party. From a discussions perspective, the marketing team probably don't need to know about cdn.website.com. So it depends. Makes sense. Okay. So maybe like in the audit, when you're presenting the marketing team, that's not in that discussion of that spreadsheet. Yeah. Yep. Third parties are like, um, like colloquially what I mean is, uh, yeah, analytics, uh, font providers, tracking, that kind of stuff. Technically what I mean is anything on a different origin. Cool. Um, so third parties truly are like the party, the guest that keeps inviting other. I, the, the analogy absolutely works. Um, what do you do in a situation where you're trying to audit a site, and let's say that they've got a third party, uh, the example given was a real-time bidding sort of situation, mm -hmm. where the third party scripts and domains change based on potentially page load to page load or day to day. How do you audit that? Like you, the example is they're getting like 500 or so different third party things coming in, but they can't predict or anticipate what those domains are. Um, well, I think the answer there, unfortunately, is you can't really audit that. If they're changing at will and that frequently, uh, you could gather historical data and see if you can spot any patterns. So um, in your RUM tool, you might be able to say, oh, there's a spike this day, and it was, oh, it was that domain again. You could do things historically. But if it is that kind of random or that frequently changing, uh, you are on the back foot. Um, so there's not really much you could do against that, I guess. Is there a more specific part to the question, like? No, I mean, I think that was the gist. Mm -hmm. Like, things are changing from the auditing perspective. Yeah. The, the, if you run the audit one day versus another off web page test, you're going to get very different results. Yeah. I mean, the, the sort of line in there, I guess, the route in would be which third party is going out to those, and maybe you could have a discussion with them. So if you've got, like, a bidding service on your site, maybe you could speak to the bidding service and say, hey, is there any way we can have a bit more consistency? Uh, you know, so there could be a route in that way, but from a purely technical and auditing perspective, if it changes that often, then... You, you've got to measure, but well, you can't really do anything about that. So in your experience doing the third party work that you've done, have you had much success or found many situations where you were able to move some of this to the server side? Like, do a lot of these offerings or services provide some sort of server side connection or, or data transfer that would ease a lot of these concerns? Um, as a general rule, A B testing on the client is the devil. Uh, so, any server side A B testing, yeah? Um, <laughs> so, if, you're going, if you have to A-B test on the client, do the most granular, tiny possible tests you can and load that asynchronously. There's no point blocking the entire page as rendering if you're just changing the copy in one button, right? Um, but where possible, uh, A-B test on the server. Uh, that's a really common use case. So if you're looking at an A-B testing provider, uh, ask them or, or just see if they've got a server-side uh, option because that is always going to be quicker. And then just sort of to, to round it out, I wanted to lob a softball right at the end. Does the, uh, does the web have lob a business softball. model problem? Yeah. Like, like, we're talking about all of this third-party stuff. You're talking about stripping out as much of the excess as possible. But at the end of the day, companies are still going to need some of this for analytics or for revenue. Do we have a bigger foundational issue? Well, yeah, I mean, the web's kind of, it was built on uh, admirable principles, right? Free access for everyone. But then in a sort of capitalist world, that 
someone's got to pay for it somehow, right? So I empathize with publishers who need to run ads. Um, They've kind of shot themselves in the foot there by saying, hey, our, our entire website's online now for free, and then 10 years later thinking, oh, no one's buying the print version. What have we done? But I've got quite a controversial opinion. I think as a performance engineer, everyone expects me to think the fastest website is the best one. As long as it's fastest, that's the best. But what happens if um, you've got a site that makes, say, 100 million pounds or 100 million euro a year, right, e-commerce, that's too much, let's say 10 million. Uh, you want to add a script to that to do some A-B testing, to get some insights. And that script makes the page 300 milliseconds slower. Now, a lot of case studies tell you that, well, 300 milliseconds is worth 8 mil to train line. That's, that's a lot of money to lose. But what if the insights from that marketing tool make you far more money than the performance degradation lost you, right? So there's an awkward, like, and I don't know where those paths, like, cross, but you've got to weigh up, like, the business value of a slightly slower website if the data it gives you is, is useful. So it's not always about the fastest website, it's whatever version of the website makes the most money or gets the most donations or has the most signups or, or whatever your KPIs are. Uh, there is like a sweet spot where the data you're gathering will potentially slow down the experience, but the quality of that data may ultimately make you more money. Uh, so that's why I don't take a too hard line stance on third parties. Uh, they, are, uh, they are necessary for a lot of businesses to function. Uh, it's just my job to take the edge off it and make sure that business is safeguarded from outages, slowdowns, etc. That's a really good answer. Unfortunately, you did say that um, it's possible for a slow site to be a better site, so I'm going to have to ask you to leave for the rest of it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a performance conference. That area. was a misfire, wasn't yeah, it? I said that yeah. in front of no, no, thank you, 300 guys. developers. <laughs> no, yeah. Thank you. It was very good, man. No, thank cool. you. Cheers, dude. Thank you.